Okay, welcome to the companion video to The Last Commodore. Um, this is basically going to be a more in-depth, behind-the-scenes uh, effort to get this machine up and running for the first video. <laughs> so I'll kind of go a little more in-depth, uh, take our time going through different pieces. We'll fire it up, do some benchmarks, play some games, and uh, yeah, we'll just generally see what it can do. Now, full disclosure, uh, as I've mentioned probably before in the other video, it has been over 25 some odd years since I had a 46 as my daily driver uh, and at least that long since I had a DOS based computer as a machine that I used every day. I'm in my mid 40s. Um, I was definitely contemporaneous to this. I remember going uh, to a local computer store. Uh, they sold new and used stuff and I would often bring pieces of my original computer in to trade in and then upgrade, and I remember very distinctly upgrading to the 486. That was probably the most exciting upgrade I ever did. You know, things were just, it was, it was different back then. I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, you can still do an upgrade and, with modern hardware and get a major difference. And that's very true. You know, if you go from a conventional hard drive to a solid state drive, absolutely, you're gonna notice a big difference in performance. But there was just something special about this era, you know, because all you really had to do was change the CPU and boom, you had a completely different computer in some respects. And it was just exciting because like every so many months there was some new CPU out and there was always something on the horizon that was gonna be the next big thing that you had to have. Whether it was going from a 286 to a 386 or 486, uh, whether it was updating your graphics card to something that actually did 3D acceleration, uh, going from DOS to Windows 95, uh, getting a CD-ROM for the first time. There was so much exciting stuff going on back then and it's really hard to relate how exciting that was to people who have grown up with the iPhone, right? Because, you know, you don't appreciate what it's like to go from four color CGA graphics to blazing 256 color graphics with all of the, uh, the depth and texture and everything that, that that gives you. We just take that for granted now. So yeah, this uh, companion video basically will just sort of be a little trip down memory lane and uh, opening this thing up, seeing it in fuller detail. You know, it, it's not gonna be anything mind blowing because it is at its heart basically just a generic 486. But nonetheless, it does have a tie in with Commodore. Commodore knew about this computer. They licensed it. They agreed to let 3D microcomputers operate essentially as a unit of Commodore. So yeah, I mean, if you're gonna have, I don't have a lot of x86 machines. I, you know, I just don't use them a lot. Um, quite honestly, you know, I, I don't get as nostalgic about them, I think, as other YouTubers do, because for me, I spent a huge chunk of my youth running these things. And I feel like I've kind of done everything that I wanted or could have wanted to do with a 46. And there's certain things that, you know, you just can't relive. like. Uh, reliving the thrill of running Windows 95 for the first time. I'm using the word thrill liberally there. <laughs> but you know what I mean, like it's, there's just experiences that can't be had again. And you know, I'm getting older, you know, I'm more aware of my mortality and I wanna spend more time doing other things. And if I'm gonna be doing vintage computing stuff, I'm gonna go for stuff that I don't really know. You know, you know things that were happening before I was born or when I was too young to have a computer. So I'm experimenting more with stuff from the 70s and I'm having a lot of fun with that. But yeah, every once in a while, I like to fire these up. And sort of the strategy that I've had uh, for my x86 collection is basically to have one of each sort of generation from the 8088 up through the Pentium. And that way I wanted to try and maintain a bridge from the earliest to the newest. And that way, if I needed to transfer software back and forth, I could. Um, if I wanted to play a game somewhat authentically, I could, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, if you're going to have any 46, why not have a Commodore, right? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll uh, basically lay this thing down with the tower open and we'll start uh, looking at the guts a little more in depth. Okay, so we got the machine opened up and on its side and yeah, you can see it's pretty bog standard PC stuff in here. Uh, I've got a PC chips. 486 motherboard, it's like a socket three. I don't remember my sockets from way back then. Um, it has IDE on board. It has 72 pin SIMs. I think these empty sockets are for cache memory. Uh, it's, it's got VLB. 
It's nothing uh, super fancy. Um, I don't remember PC chips being a particularly great brand back in the day, but this is pretty similar to what I would have had uh, when I purchased my upgrade uh, for my computer because you know I didn't really know much about motherboard manufacturers, chipsets, stuff like that. I was more interested in is it a 486 and can it fit in my uh, desktop case. So I'm pretty sure my board was something fairly similar to this one. DX4 100, so that's still untouched and uh, <laughs> it's got no heatsink, no fan, nothing. And yeah, we can pull up some of the uh, cards here. I'll have a look at our problematic video card. Another thing I'll draw your attention to is the CBM parts label here on the power supply. Um, basically 3D Micro put these labels on every part in the computer. And that was just so that they knew, you know, which parts were theirs for warranty purposes. And that's kind of good for me as a collector because I can actually tell, you know, which parts were original by the presence of those stickers because they wouldn't usually fall off. And uh, you can see they're labeling it as CBM, Commodore Business Machines. So, yeah, this was the CBM personal computer, although you don't see Commodore anywhere on any of the actual components. Okay, so here's our problematic video card. This is a Trident something or other. 9440 chip on it there. And it's PCI. Yeah, I've, I've long forgotten my <laughs> tech specs for cards like these. Uh, we can see we've got a 3D part label on it here. 3D as in 3D microcomputers, so that's interesting. Uh, and it looks like the uh, QA label, we've got a date of 1995. October 1st, which is interesting because that's way after uh, the Commodore deal kind of fell apart. So I don't know. It's possible that the agreement that they had with Commodore, um, you know, being a legal agreement, it may have carried over for some time uh, after the bankruptcy. Or it's possible this is a replacement part and it's needing to be replaced again. Let's see what else we have in here. This is a EV206 sound card and it's got some kind of proprietary it's Panasonic it looks like it's got connectors for different uh, types of CD-ROMs man I forgot all about this uh, <laughs> I'm so spoiled with SATA everything nowadays I've forgotten that uh, there was a time when CD-ROMs were first coming out that they were not IDE they were uh, their own proprietary things. You had uh, Panasonic, you had Sony. I think there was Oak or one other one. Uh, yeah, so they've got different headers here depending on which type of CD-ROM you're using. This one is evidently a Panasonic. So yeah, that's gonna be something I have to figure out because I'll have to find actual drivers to, to get that to work again. I don't know about the card though. I don't know whose this is. It kind of looks like a clone of a Sound Blaster 2, but it's got this extra stuff on it. Yeah, I was trying to see if I could make out a name anywhere. LGP M8179. Yeah, I'm going to have to look it up. So this is 3D also. Uh, and this is December of 1994. So this is kind of turning into a pattern here. So if this thing was being produced in December under an agreement with Commodore from December of 93, then uh, yeah, this would definitely be among the last Commodores ever made. This is the floppy controller. Okay, CBM. Yeah, I think the four and five basically mean 94, 95, and this is slash 95. So this computer actually dates from 1995. I would say. That's just a standard controller. So this is probably sort of the, uh, what's the word, interregnum <laughs> in between uh, when Commodore failed and when everything, and perhaps when the liquidation finished. I don't know how that works. You know, if you have a licensing contract with a company and it goes bankrupt, um, I don't know if that's like when you rent an apartment under a lease and uh, your landlord sells your apartment to somebody else, uh, whether your, your lease continues until the end and then it's up to your new landlord whether they want to uh, renew it or not, I don't know. 
But yeah, I, I think this machine is actually 1995. So this particular box appears to be post-bankruptcy. Okay, so here's another one. Yeah, that's interesting. We got a 3D and a CBM sticker on it. Look at that, five years warranty. That's for the modem. Yeah, I can't really... Unfortunately, they don't all have QA labels, so I can't really tell exactly. But yeah, I'm guessing with the five slashed out, that's 1995, so. Yeah, so that's interesting. That kind of uh, put some of what I said earlier in the video into question a little bit, because this may be a post-bankruptcy machine. Uh, you know, legally, it's exactly the same as uh, a machine produced before Commodore went bankrupt, but I thought this deal kind of ended abruptly with the bankruptcy of Commodore. So, but like I said, it depends on how the legal system works. If they were able to sort of carry this out under contract for a while, if they had a whole bunch of these produced already and then just sort of disseminated them uh, to run down inventory after bankruptcy happened and before the agreement finally expired. Yeah, or maybe the agreement carried on and the new owners at, uh, I forget who bought the Commodore property the first time around. I think it was Escom. Maybe they just chose not to renew it because they were going to produce their own. So the next thing I'm going to have to do is find a video card, uh, which is going to be kind of tricky uh, because we need a PCI video card. Isn't that weird too? I'm so used to seeing motherboards with dedicated video card slots and this does not have that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to have to dig through pretty much a whole pile of my computers and see if I can find another PCI video card to test with and then we'll kind of take it from there. Okay, well that was uh, about a half hour of diving around and looking through stuff in my shop and uh, yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised, kind of not surprised that uh, it proved to be kind of difficult to find a video card. I did find one. Uh, this is an S3 Verge, Verge, I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, I remember S3 being a thing back in the day. This one was produced 1998. So yes, yeah, it's a little newer than this system, but you know, I have lots of stuff from Intel 8088 era up to 286. Yeah, I just, uh, I know I had quite a few of these kind of systems back in the day, but I mostly recycled them because I just, you know, they were just junk. I didn't really want them hanging around. My strategy with collecting PCs uh, generally has been to sort of collect enough to form kind of a bridge from the earliest PC to the latest one. And the reason for that is just so that I have a way to, you know, move software around back and forth between different generations of computer. Um, you know, to have one or two 486s I think is enough for me. I, I don't really want to have, you know, racks of 486s and Pentiums that just sit around and take up space in my house and never really get used. So, yeah, we'll throw that in there. Yeah, I just, I just don't have a lot of stuff from that vintage anymore. Okay, so we've got our video card problem sorted. So the next thing we need to do is put a hard drive in this thing. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, one of the conditions uh, for being allowed to have this machine was that I had to literally destroy the hard drive. Uh, I sent it down to a professional shredder. Now, obviously I have no idea what was in here originally. This was a long time ago when I got this machine and yeah, I, I just wish I'd taken note of that, but yeah, I had to destroy the drive. That was part of the deal. Um, like I said, it went to the shredder. So yeah, I don't really remember what was sort of contemporaneous for these machines. So I'm actually referring back to that Commodore ad from December of 93, which is, you know, a year or so before this machine was actually produced. And it looks like they were using uh, those weird between 100 meg and gigabyte drives which I've completely forgotten about. So like 245 megabytes, I think there were 535 megabytes or just drives that were sort of sandwiched in the middle there. Um, I've, I've completely, completely forgotten about all that. Um, in my memory, I thought I went from a 100 meg drive to a gigabyte, but I could be wrong. I think I might've even gone to like a 300 meg or something in between. And uh, yeah, those are the drives I don't have. I just, I looked around um, yeah I just don't have very many machines of this vintage and in a lot of cases the hard drives would have been replaced anyway so 
Yeah, I'm really regretting throwing out all that stuff now, but uh, well, not really. I like having space in my house. So yeah, we're stuck with uh, drives like this, which are a little bit too early. 80 megs is more 386 era. Or we have drives like this. This is pretty much the earliest uh, that I can get without going all the way back to 286, 386, um, 4.3 gigabytes. That's, uh, that's still a little bit on the big side, I think. Um, I'm 99% sure the hard drive was a three and a half inch, so it would have been something like this. So, so I could use this. This is certainly something that a machine like this could have been upgraded to later. And then, yeah, I start getting into much bigger drives. I think this one's a, yeah, this is a 20.4 gig. That's a little bit outside the era of these machines. And then I have this one. <laughs> Yeah, Quantum Bigfoot, baby. Five and a quarter inches. I think it's about, what do we got here? Yeah, it's anywhere from four to 12 gay. So again, it's a little bit outside of spec probably, even at the smaller end, but man, that looks cool. I have this sitting around, I know it works. I had totally forgotten that these drives even existed. In my head, it went from those huge five and a quarter inch drives that were tiny capacity to these three and a half inch, but I had forgotten that there were these, uh, I guess they're like quarter height, five and a quarter inch drives. They just look awesome. And this one doesn't have a home. So I'm thinking this, it's not gonna be correct, but it's as close as I'm gonna get until I can find uh, a drive that's more of the correct size for these. So I think I'm gonna go with this one just for the coolness factor. I know it works. So yeah, let's just put that in. And I think my jumpers are set correctly, if I remember. And cable select. Slide the hard drive in. Yeah, that really sticks into the case. That's a big drive. Wow. <laughs> yeah, this is a little tight. But it looks awesome. Okay, so we'll get this hooked up and uh, yeah, then we'll fire it up. I believe this drive has DOS 5 or DOS 6 on there. DOS 6 seems to be what these were shipping with back in the day. I don't believe Windows 95 was officially available until August of 95, and this machine appears to be very early 95, so yeah, this would definitely be a DOS machine. All right, here is the star of the show, the Commodore 4655 MT. Um, I don't really know what the significance of the model name is. I mean, obviously 46 corresponds to the CPU, but I don't know what 55 corresponds to. MT might be multimedia tower or multimedia technology or something like that. Multimedia was a huge buzzword in the early to mid nineties because CD-ROMs were coming out and everybody was pushing the, you know, you can have an encyclopedia in your house and it doesn't take up a whole wall. <laughs> so that could have been uh, the push there. Interestingly, uh, they didn't go with the typical freezer key lock uh, that you normally see on these things for the, the keyboard lock. They went with an actual key. Uh, which obviously is long lost and thankfully uh, this particular one is in the unlocked position. I used to love those freezer keys. We had a uh, computer lab at our school and the best computer is the teacher's computer and they always kept the keyboard locked. Uh, but they also allowed us access to the computer lab unsupervised. So every once in a while I'd bring in the actual keys to our big chest freezer that we had at the house and I'd unlock the thing and then we'd uh, use the real computer rather than the crappy little Sanyo units they had in there. For the visuals today, we're gonna to be using the IBM 8513. Uh, this monitor is near and dear to my heart. It's my first color VGA monitor, the first one that our family had. We did have a VGA monitor before that, but it was a paper white, which there was nothing paper white about it. It was just a monochrome. Um, yeah, back in the days when monitors were really expensive and there was a significant price difference between the two, enough uh, to be worthwhile for my thrifty dad to choose the, the monochrome rather than the color. But we did get the color eventually and I'm pretty sure this is the one that we had. It seems a little, I, I literally just got it two weeks ago and it, to my memory it seems quite a bit smaller than what I remember. But. Uh, that just, just may be the, the tricks of memory. I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure it was an 8513. This is also the only 
CRT VGA monitor that I have. I used to have piles of these things and now they're all gone. I just, they were lying around, they weren't getting used and uh, you know, some of them were kind of fuzzy or whatever and I just didn't want to be bothered repairing them. So unfortunately I ended up getting rid of a lot of them. All right, so I guess we'll power it up here and check it out. our videos fixed thanks to swapping video cards picture actually looks pretty good considering I, I got this monitor for like 40 bucks and uh, I wasn't really expecting much I thought it would get destroyed on the way here that's why I usually try to keep it cheap for CRTs um, yeah so we got our 46 DX4 20 megs of RAM that was that would have been a ton of RAM back in the day I would have loved to have had that much and our ports parallel ports BIOS date appears to be the end of 1994, so again, the computer probably is end of 1994, early 1995. Just take a look in the BIOS here. Oh, wow. Yeah, I totally um, had this exact BIOS on my 46. Um, now, my 46... I couldn't afford to buy a complete tower unit like this. I basically just upgraded my machine part by part, trading in the old parts uh, as credit against whatever I was buying. But I'm pretty sure I had this exact bias and I remember thinking, wow, this is really, <laughs> really advanced. Um, our floppy drive is 1.44 meg. Yeah, that's correct. And we've got our disk cable, which I guess you could enter stuff in. But I don't know how to do that anymore because it's been almost 30 years. Yeah, this is all the standard stuff. It's kind of interesting. They they had this graphical mouse-driven BIOS, and then they kind of went away from those for a while. Uh, let's see here. Power management. Ooh. That's disabled. And then this, I think, is... Yeah, this detects the hard drive. I'm pretty sure that... Bigfoot drive is a four gig, so that's that seems about right. Got here, antivirus. Ooh, <laughs> for a complete virus protection package, contact 800 U buy AMI. I should try that actually, <laughs> just see if they're <laughs> willing to sell me an antivirus package still. Okay, well that all seems to be fine, so let's just get out of here. I do love how quickly it gets to the DOS prompt and is ready to go. Uh, even a really, really fast machine with Windows 10 solid state does not get there that quickly. Uh, yeah, kind of miss that. So I figure we'll do some benchmarking here. I don't know if my benchmarks are fully up to date for this, but let's just see what top bench thinks we have. So, yeah, it seems to think our CPU is 66 megahertz, so I don't know if that's because the database isn't up to date or if that's how it's actually performing right now, which would kind of suck. Uh, yeah, the closest is a Toshiba Satellite 105, but I think that's probably wrong. Uh, specs are, uh, it says 16 megs, not 20, so that's not right either. All right, well, that's, uh, that's probably not most accurate. Let's try 3D Bench and see how things come up there. Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> I remember being so impressed by graphics like these. It was just sort of getting out of the old two-dimensional 16-color EGA stick figure thing. Yeah, I and mean, that's pretty decent. My 286 could not do that. Okay, what else can we do? Well, I think we can check out Windows. Windows 3.1, that is. Yeah, this machine obviously is a little bit before Windows 95 was out, so almost certainly it would have shipped with DOS 6 and uh, maybe with Windows 3.1. Yeah, 
And the screen's going a little funky. I think that's more the monitor than the computer, but it could be the driver that I'm using too. Windows 3.1, here is the killer app. This is the only reason you want Windows 3.1. <laughs> it's the only reason I ever saw anybody using Windows 3.1. Um, not true, but you know, uh, this was uh, something I always saw people playing all the time at home, in school libraries, all over the place. Um, what else have we got here? And here we have... Yeah, now this was one thing that did kind of attract me to Windows 3.1 a little bit. I, I mostly avoided it because I just didn't like how slow it ran on my computer. Um, at the time I would have had a I probably hadn't upgraded to a 486 yet. It would have been a 286, and it was slow. Um, but I loved the idea of being able to type uh, in Word for Windows at the time and have what I was actually typing showing up on the screen instead of with the old DOS editors where you would be typing and you had no idea if, you know, if it would show up exactly the way you had planned it on your printer. You kind of took it on faith that it would. For the most part, I didn't bother with it because it just kind of felt like it was something that was going on top. Uh, and it just was kind of surplus to my needs. There was nothing other than uh, ha there was nothing other than word processing or desktop publishing that really appealed to me about it. All right, let's get out of here. I mean, this is moving pretty nicely. This is reasonably fast. I don't know how fast the original hard drive would have been. I seem to remember this machine being quite slow uh, when I first encountered it uh, prior to the upgrade, but uh, yeah, this is moving quite acceptably. Uh, let's try a game and try 4D Boxing. 4D Boxing was the first game that I ever played with VGA on my own computer. Um, I got my own personal PC. Oh, probably very early 90s. My dad, in a stroke of generosity, decided to give me one. Um, he got it from a friend of ours that owned a computer store. Uh, it had monochrome graphics, so I had to, to deal with that for a while, but eventually I got a VGA card for Christmas, and then shortly after we were able to afford a monitor for it. And this was one of the first games that I ever played on it. But I remember being very impressed with uh, the 3D graphics because it kind of reminded me of that Dire Straits video, the money for nothing. <laughs> I just thought it all looked kind of cool. It had that kind of look to it. Oh yeah. This is like real sound. Holy cow, I'd totally forgotten about this. Distinctive software, Vancouver shout out. Yeah, I remember being absolutely floored by real sound. Um, you know, because I'd always been told that the only way you could have sound like this was if you purchased a two or three hundred dollar sound card. And then all of a sudden, these programs started coming out, and suddenly my PC speaker was doing this. I was like, "Wow, you could do this the whole time. Why weren't we?" <laughs> okay, now I have a bad feeling this is copy protected, so I probably. I didn't print off the guide for that one. And in my recollection, that was always a problem because I was poor and we were often downloading games from pirate boards and we didn't have, you know, PDFs of manuals available. So, uh, you know, it depended on whether somebody bothered to type the manual out or type out certain instructions into a readme file, or sometimes you had to borrow the manual from somebody. So yeah, I just didn't have any way to get in there. Uh, let's try another one. I believe this is an access game, so it's probably going to have the real sound as well. Cool, so let me pass. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what it's supposed to look like. Yeah, this is uh 
And that froze right up. Oh dear. No, nope, that really locked up. Yeah, this is back in the days when uh, you couldn't be 100% certain that a game would work with your particular hardware. There were so many variations of hardware and it was all DOS based and sometimes things worked perfectly and sometimes they didn't. It's not like today where you just download a game from the app store and poof, it works. Yeah. All right, let's try a different one. Uh, let's see. And okay, we don't have a mouse detected. I do have a mouse, obviously. We saw it working in Windows. Uh, this is a Tandy. I think this is a Microsoft compatible mouse, so I'm going to try... The Microsoft driver. So we got mouse.com, mouse.sys. I believe the one is loaded memory resident and stays there, and the other one is loaded just at will when you need it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty pathetic. <laughs> You know, like, I used to have a 46 as my daily driver, but it was 20-plus-something years ago. And I've just forgotten a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, having to load a mouse driver, having to set a path, having to do this and that. Um, yeah, I've gotten really spoiled. There's kids out there playing with this hardware right now, and they know more than I do because I've simply forgotten everything. Um, okay, so we've got our mouse up. Let's go back to count. Real sound, of course. Nice. Our mouse, we do. Yeah, you know the story. I think he wakes up in a psych ward or something. I do love these early 256 color EJ graphics. This was so mind blowing for us. You know, those of us that had gotten used to Hercules. Four color CGA, 16 color VGA, stick figure kind of graphics. You know, and this was like real photorealistic stuff. I remember one of the first things we did when we got a VGA capable computer uh, was we installed PC Paint and I actually downloaded some real pictures and started messing around with those. And I just, I don't know, for some reason that just blew my mind away. I was like, oh, I can make this rose twice as large or, you know, just do all these different things with it. But yeah, this is, uh, I think this is one of the coolest eras because you've got kind of a blend of the old school and new school here. You've got way more colors, so you've got way more detail, uh, but it's not quite 100% photorealistic. Uh, there's still obviously some limits with the resolution and it still has a kind of a cartoony look to it. Yeah, it's just a really classic era. Uh, we got there, is that a cup? To do with that. There's something shiny under there. There's a key. Okay. Uh, looks like a chart on the bed. The chart reads patient name, Mason Powers, accident victim, ouch, severe concussion, multiple lacerations and contusions, exploratory surgery. <laughs> so realistic blinking. Yeah, that's, uh, that's these early EGA graphics. So realistic. <laughs> so foreboding. Honestly, they've got the atmosphere right in this game, but uh, yeah, the uh, the animations and the the speaking parts are <laughs> kind of take you out of it a little bit. Yeah, so that's that. So I think our next goal here should be to try and get some of the other attached hardware working. I'd really love to see the CD-ROM operate, um, and then I'd like to test the notion that that sound card is Sound Blaster based. So yeah, let's uh, we'll start with the sound card. So for this test, uh, basically I'm going to be using these Logitech 2.0 speakers, which are thoroughly modern. Um, unfortunately, I just didn't keep a lot of the period correct speakers. They really weren't worth keeping. They weren't very good. They were very tinny uh, and they tended to start having static and 
all kinds of issues as they aged and uh, I just didn't use them often enough so unfortunately most of them got thrown away but you know these will do they're not they're a little bit conspicuous but we can live with that uh, so we'll go back to countdown again and we'll try enabling the sound card mouse driver. I will learn. Okay, let's try it again. So mouse. Now this is again, I don't remember from 20 plus years ago, if you had to load a sound card driver before you loaded the game. I think the game loads it. So I'll select Sound Blaster. I don't know any of this stuff. I'm pretty sure it's 220H. I seem to remember that from looking at the board earlier. It has all the, the jumpers there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> Definitely more awake than I was about two seconds ago. Uh, I'm just gonna turn that down. That is a little bit on the loud side. Yeah, so obviously that, uh, that operates. That's great. Um, but we're frozen. Hardware issues. Again. And, okay, so it's not completely jammed. Well, that's unfortunate. Okay, so we'll switch to a different game. Maybe I'll try Stunts. That was a, an old favorite of mine back in the day. Um, okay, so MCGA, and we've already got Sound Blaster picked already. That's fantastic. Let's try this. Hmm. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's not what it's supposed to sound like, I don't think. It sounds like my grade one band class. Oh dear. Oh, at least the game's not freezing. That's always a plus. And once again, distinctive software, Vancouver, my hometown. Awesome. Okay, let's get to the menu here. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're definitely not doing well on this one. But let's see, uh, what car should I drive? Well, it's got to be a Countach, I think. What kind of colors have we got here? Oh yeah, purple. It's got to be purple. And our opponent. Love these realistic photos. God, I love 256 color VGA. Uh, yeah, let's just choose that guy. What the heck? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of remembering what the soundtrack's supposed to sound like, and this is not it. All right, so I'll do Bernie's. All right, here we go. And we've got copy protection again, but I was prepared for it. I have this printed out, so it has all the copy protection questions. This is five, 12, and three cables. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. That actually sounds quite good. Oh, screwed that up. There's my opponent. Yeah, this is nice and smooth. I think I first played this on my 286 and it was nowhere near the smooth. Oh, oh that sucks. Okay, hang on. We gotta start that over again. That's not okay. It's been a long time since I played this game. Yeah, the sound seems to be, like, the engine noise seems to be completely fine. It's just the music. It seems to have mega issues. Yeah, I 
keyboard driving is not my forte. And especially this game, because it has so many bloody sharp turns. I just suck at it. I hope there's none of those loop-de-loops. I sucked at those. Oh no. It's one of those raised platforms with the walls. I used to hit those all the time. This was a pretty cool game though back in the day. This was like, wow. And especially because you could make your own tracks. Yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty acceptable. Here we go for the big jump. Oh. Yeah. oh, we're spinning right out. Oh, this sucks. He's gonna totally catch up to me now. Oh shit, what are those? That looks like a loop. No. And we're spun out. Luckily, the AI seems to be even worse than I am. <laughs> Stoplight. That looks so real. Nice little shed there, too. Beautiful. And another stoplight. Why are they putting medians in the middle of this track? Oh, that was close. That was... That was very close. Here we go. Here we go. I think it said the record time was four minutes. Yeah, so far it sounds holding out pretty good here. It's just the music that seems to be the issue. Oh, I forgot how to do these. Well, that's that. <laughs> uh, I hate seeing him win. He's just got that punchable face. <laughs> yeah, so the music's buggered for some reason, but uh, the sound sounds pretty good. I don't know if maybe it's like a left-right thing and we're missing one channel. I don't know, that's weird. Okay, so the final thing I'll try and get going here is the CD-ROM. Now, this is guaranteed to be a lot more difficult because, uh, you know, we're used to 2021 and optical drives being just a SATA cable, you plug it in, computer figures it out, but back when these were brand new, uh, there was a whole lot of proprietary stuff out there, all kinds of different uh, standards and controllers, which I remember very clearly. My first CD-ROM I got specifically for my bulletin board because I wanted to put a whole bunch of files online, shareware files, not pirated, because I couldn't do that. Um, and yeah, I think mine was a Sony, if I remember correctly. And I had a bugger of a time getting it to work because it had a proprietary controller and you had to load just the right software, just the right way, or it would not work. So yeah, I, I am definitely very fuzzy on this. So that's going to be a problem. Another problem is going to be figuring out exactly which driver works with this drive. Um, going by where it's plugged into the controller, I think it's a Panasonic, but I don't know. I mean, the cable could have been moved. Uh, I've played with this machine years and years ago when I first got it. Who knows what I did. Uh, and of course the sound card has multiple ports because it supports various different proprietary CD-ROMs. So it could be Panasonic, it could be Sony or Mitsumi, it could be anything. So yeah, and then of course optical drives generally, especially back in the day, did not have a long shelf life. So it's quite possible this thing's just completely hosed. Um, 
it does open though, so there's that. And here's our <laughs> old Lexmark printer desk. But uh, I'll just bring my little road up here. Let's see if we can hear it actually running. Yeah, I, I don't think it's actually spinning. I'm not really hearing anything. Let's just pop that out again. Okay, so let's f I'm gonna face it this way. So the Lexmark is up. And then I'll let it go. I'll just wait a minute. I'll open it back up again, see if it's in the same place. Oh, no, it's, it is spinning. It's probably not a high speed CD-ROM, so that's probably why I'm not hearing that familiar wind. So, yeah, I mean, it's turning. Uh, okay, so what I did is I went online and I had heard that this card was now, I had heard that this card was Sound Blaster compatible. So initially I went online and I was looking at Sound Blaster CD drivers because that was something Sound Blaster did back in the day. They offered a CD-ROM controller on a lot of their cards. And uh, I don't know if it was their own proprietary design or if they had one particular one. I think they tended to favor Matsushita or Panasonic. So I thought I'd try those, but then as I was doing my research, I eventually stumbled onto the actual believed manufacturer of this card, which appears to be Zoltrix, and it appears to be a Zoltrix 1600. So I thought, okay, and I kind of looked at the drivers online that were available, and yeah, it, and it had all the different CD-ROM types that were available for it. So I think this is probably a Zoltrix, and uh, it's kind of cool to, to hear that name again, because Zoltrix was the maker of my first fast modem that I got for my Bolton board. Uh, I think it was like a 14.4K. So yeah, it's kind of neat hearing that name again. Um, so basically I just went in and I downloaded the drivers for the Panasonic, obviously, because that's what we think this is. Unfortunately, the drive doesn't have any indicators anywhere on it as to what model it is. Uh, the only labels I was able to find when I had it out was just on the back, and they basically just say, you know, here's where the controller plugs in, here's where the uh, audio cable plugs in, and that's pretty much it, so. So yeah, we'll try this Zoltrix. Now again, it's been 25, 30 something years, I can't remember how this all worked. Um, I did take note of the address for the CD-ROM um, because you need to know that. And uh, fortunately the board is well marked. So it looks like it's address 340H. So I'll just try. Yeah, I don't know how that corresponds to this though. Uh, I'll just guess, I don't know. Could be anything there. This is it trying to load it and nada. Okay, so that's not working at all. Hmm. I did download another driver. This is for the Sound Blaster. But again, I don't know if this actually works. This is Panasonic. Searching for it. guess this isn't working. <laughs> it shouldn't be taking this long. I think this is, uh, we're now going on like two minutes here and it's not finding it. Yeah. All right. Well, a little more research on that is needed. So maybe that'll be a future video. All right. So that concludes our tour of the Commodore. 4655 MT, 100 megahertz, 46 computer, basically generic, but uh, you know, it does have a little bit of a coolness factor. It is legitimately licensed Commodore gear. So yeah, I mean, if you're gonna run a 46 at all, 
why not make it a Commodore? It certainly seems to have been a good value. It's lasted all this time. There's been very little in the way of modifications. Yeah, we've got some components that aren't quite working like they should, but otherwise, yeah, it pretty much works just as it did when it was new, and that's that's great. Um, yeah, anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this more in-depth tour of the machine, and uh, it's maybe triggered some uh, nostalgia for you and yeah I know for my part it definitely does it reminds me of all kinds of things that I've forgotten and uh, it's amazing to me <laughs> how much I've forgotten and it is kind of interesting you know when you get to a certain age um, the things that you would think you would never f have forgotten uh, completely gone I mean it's literally been probably 25 years since I had a 46 as my my daily driver computer and now yeah, now I'm just looking backwards and I'm completely lost. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing with this thing. But anyway, um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at both videos and uh, have enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. And uh, yeah, we will see you in the next video. And thanks so much for watching.